What's my food been eating? Have you ever asked yourself this question? I ask myself, but I'll tell you why. I will take you through a journey, starting with this question. Tell me what you eat. I'll tell you what you are. You've all heard this, right? I'm the little frog. I'm Laurent, I was born in Paris, and always passionate about food, a born foodie, as they say. And to me, food is this environment of richness, of where I would go down the street every day to get the veggies or the bread. Um, and every weekend, Saturday after class, I would be sent to my grandma, and she would cook the entire weekend, preparing for her 13 brothers and sisters to come for lunch on Sunday. It was a big gathering. And we would go out to the market and pick a fish like this, generally this one. That was her favorite fish. And the favorite dish is trout amandine. So this is the way you make it. It's so simple, right? Hand roast some almonds. You start to get the flavor and the smell of the almonds in the room. Set them aside. Put your trout down. Pan roast it. Put the almonds back on top. Et voila, bon appétit. So simple, right? I was a foodie and really involved uh, with food. I started writing guides while I was in college, many of them, and I did the food review. I wrote reviews on 700 restaurants of Paris. Always going twice, always anonymous. Um, and then I'm going back to this man. His name is Bria Savarin. He was my mentor. Um, not just because he said that, but also because he wrote Physiologie du goût. 200 years ago, and that's a reference for chef around the world. It means physiology of taste, gastronomical meditation, transcendental meditations dedicated to the gastronome parisien. And what he really meant is it's what you put in your stomach, of course. But also, use your six senses when you start thinking about food. First of all, look at it. Second, take the time and smell the food. And that starts whetting your appetite, right? The third thing is you're going to touch it. And that's very experiential. And now, listen. Listen to the journey, what this food is telling you, where it's been, where it's coming from. And then you can go home, or you can take the time and taste it and enjoy it. And he said, but hold on, what's this transcendental about? Well, that's what he means. Food has to be fun, too. I studied food, and I studied marketing of food at a large company called Beatrice Food that had great, great brands. And then years later, I ran this company based in Paris. This is a company that's over 100 years old. It's been creating foods with 200 chefs when I was there. I ran it for six years. We created thousands of different products in every category you could think of, from haricot vert to foie gras, and then, the best part, every week we had tastings, and I would never miss them. So, the tasting goes that, like that. It's blind tasting, and you try to understand really what's in that food, but where it's coming from. And when I asked the chef, for example, we were tasting olive oil. Not dipping bread, but just enjoying the olive oil itself by the glass, smelling it. And they said, you know the difference between all these olive oils? It's the terroir, the soil. That's the difference. They have the same sun. So I asked them, I said, well, tell me about the veal. Where is it coming from? And what is the veal been eating? They said, well, the veal is, is veau élevé sous la mer, so that means under the mother. It was raised that way and drank the milk of, her, of his mother, and the mother ate the grass and the flowers. Sounds pretty normal, right? But then I said, and this particular veal, you say, is the best. So where is that one? He said, oh, it's about three hours from Paris. We can go. And I said, I want to visit. I want to see the place. So we went there. It, it's saw the house. And I said, you know, it's OK. I, I want to I see. I want to understand and, and see what's special about the place. Now, what was really special about the place is at the end of the visit, I asked the manager, I said, what do you do with the carcasses and all the leftovers? He said, oh, we make fish pellets. Fish what? Fish pellets. Have you ever heard of fish pellets? I didn't. I said, well, where are these made? Two miles down, there's a farm, and that's where they make them. There's a factory. I said, fish pellets, huh? Uh, can I go? I would like to see this place. So we went, and it was a trout farm. A what? Yes, it was a trout farm. 
I was kind of shocked to see, you know, all these trouts in basins, and there were thousands of them. And guess what? That's all they ate. The system is very simple. You have hundreds of basins, millions of trouts, and they're fed automatically those fish pellets. But what really got to me, and got me really angry, is, you know, the smell of the place was terrible. It was not just the carcasses, it was the inside and everything else used to make these pellets. So guess what? If you are what you eat, you also are what your food has been eating, right? Think of it for a second. I mean, the result for me is, again, I was really angry and disgusted. And, and the result of it is, I cannot eat trout anymore. There's several reasons why sometimes you cannot eat something, of course. And I would argue in some ways you're not just what you eat, you're what you don't eat for all kinds of reasons. Maybe because you can't afford the food, maybe you're a celiac, you have allergies. Sometimes you would love to get your hands on the food, but unfortunately you live in food desert. And what you have to do then is get processed food inside in, instead. So another reason could be your religion says, do shall not eat that. Or this is not food, hold on, it's a pet. Or the same culture would argue that maybe this is food, where others says, no, 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 this is an endangered species, it's not food, right? In any case, I started wondering and said, okay, what can I do about this? What can we do collectively about this? And that's when magic happens, three years ago. I get this phone call from an old friend from business school who said, you know, we have this new program at Harvard. Five schools are getting together and building this new facility, the advanced leadership, where fellows like you can build projects, bringing in the knowledge, bringing in the technology, and all the resources of our schools at Harvard. So I said, I, I, I can try that. Let me speak to some of the faculty. This man changed my journey and my life because what he did, this is Barry Bloom. He was the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. And when I told him over lunch my story about the trout, he said, you're damn right, they're not the same between the farm trout and the wild trout. Incidentally, it's the other way. He said, you know, this is the wild trout, the smaller one. The farm, they make them bigger, faster. But not only this, he said, they look the same. But the reality is there's more good stuff like omega-3 in the wild, and there's more bad stuff like antibiotics and toxins in the farmed one. And he said, you know, think about it. You're going to be here for a couple of years study. Does obesity have anything to do with this? Or tweaking our food like that? So that's what I did. I started looking. And this is what it looked like in 1985 per the CDC. We already had these blue dots, 10% obesity, 10% of the population. Just five years later, it spread out 10% across the country, going to 15%. So just 10 years, right? 1995, 15% is the dark blue. And guess what? Five years later, they had to introduce a new color, yellow, for 20% of the population is obese. That's in 2000. Five years later, introducing red. Now it's 25% in those states, and just five years later again, a new color, darker red, 30%, that's in 2010. Wait, it's not over. Just one year later, 35%, they had to introduce a new color again. Guess what? It's black. Now, it's pretty dramatic because when you look at the consequences, it's diabetes, cardiovascular disease, many kinds of cancers, it's everything we eat, everything we do with our food, and it goes on and on and on. And it's not just the list of disease that are directly associated to what we eat, it's also the cost, 147 billion today. So, again, what can we do about it? There's massive confusion. How would I know when I look at a burger like this, what's in it? Will a nutrition label tell me? I don't know how to read this, do you? I don't, our kids don't. So where's the good fat and the bad fat? Any guess? There's one good fat on this picture. It happens to be unsaturated fatty acid. 
But how would you know this? I wish sad fat and trans fat were just called bad fat. That's what we should call them, right? So let's look at the burger a little closer because I want to take you through the journey. And how would you build a burger, right? Beef, lettuce, some onion, maybe pickles, cheese, some sauce. You put a bun on top, here is a burger. Et voila. Now, a little salt and pepper, right? That's how you make it at home. I do too. Except that processed burger, the one on the picture, well, it looks more like this. A sprinkle of this with high fructose corn syrup on top, and a sprinkle of that, and more sugar, and more seasoning, and more conservative, and more coloring, and more flavoring, and a sprinkle of this, and this, and that, and this, and this, and that, and more color, all the way down to monoglycerin. That burger, the chain burger, has 78 ingredients. I kid you not. So, what do we do about it? How do we tell our kids? How do we educate them about food? This is really hard, you know? And I'll tell you what I did with our kids, David and William on this picture. As soon as they could read, I said, well, now you're big guys, you're gonna come with us to the supermarket, you can fill the cart with any kind of food you want, with one condition. You understand what the ingredients say on the label on the back. So that was the cart they filled. <laughs> I know, it was easy. It was kind of cruel. My wife said, no, you can't do that. So they would come, of course, they're smart enough, right? They come and say, hey, Dad, what does monoglycerid mean? So now we know. What is xanthan gum? Can you tell us? What is this emulsifier? OK, OK, we'll change the rule. Hold on. New rule, if it has more than five ingredients, probably not worth putting in the cart. And I introduce a new new rule. If it says modified on the package, modified anything, I don't want to hear about it. Because this is really bad stuff. Not modified food in our house, right? So that's what we did. Now, I'm coming back to the burger, but my original question was, what's been eating? You know, what's that beef been eating? Has it been, like you would hope, the beef that you crave for, that good meat where it's grazed on grass and flowers? Not quite, right? That's what the beef is eating these days. And, and I'm not kidding. It's eating corn because there's no grass there. There's no way for the beef to eat anything else but corn or soy sometimes. And is that normal? Well, let's look at the bun for a second. Now, you think the bun is an easy one, right? It's bread. As a piece of bread, we know that. Four ingredients. That's a winner. Okay, flour, yeast, salt, and water. That's all you need, right? Except the bun from processed food, the one you buy at the supermarket, well, that's that kind of bun. Again, it's high fructose corn syrup, more sugar, more glucose and fructose and all kind of oils and stuff that I don't even know. So all the way down to monoglycerin again. 32 ingredients typical on the bun. This is a real bun from a chain. And again, it's the corn. Why does it have so much sugar? What are we doing with all this corn? I want to finish with the lettuce and take you again, before we talk about technology, about the lettuce. What has it been eating, that lettuce? See, my kind of lettuce, the kind I was raised with, is this one. That's Rue Mouffetard, where I lived in Paris, and it has all kinds of lettuces, all kinds of flavors, right? And that's what the stand looks like. They all have different names, from arugula to romaine or frisé. But this lettuce, well, first of all, it's very cold, and then it's tasteless. That's why they call it iceberg, right? <laughs> but seriously, what's been eating is my question here. The soil. You think, my salad eats soil, just like my olive oil. It all comes back to the soil. And that's an easy one, right? Good soil, good water, easy. Except, in our case, has some of this and some of that and a little bit of this and that. All these pollutants. So you kind of wonder again, what should we do? I went back to the five schools working together. I was in the program for two years. I got 11 students from those schools around a table and said, what can we do? Imagine if we could set a new standard for nutritional information in a place where instead of having to read those labels that our kids can't understand, but we can't either, we would have information that is simple about the nutrients in the box so that we would know how much sugar, how much salt, how much bad fat there is in that box. 
whatever the kind of food it is. And then the same would apply to any burger, any food, any pizza on the road. So I know what's in it. Again, the nutrients. Imagine if you could know that from your TV show or the recipe from your grandma, that apple pie, and know by entering the ingredients of the show or the recipe, well, how much bad fat, how much sugar in that? Well, we can do it, they said. That's easy. There's an app for that. We'll create it. So that's what we did. We created an app, a new solution, a new standard to introduce nutrition in a simple way, in a way that's voice-powered. So now you can talk to your phone and say chicken breast, and you can read on it the calories, the sugar, the salt, the bad fat in that item in a simple language with a simple graphic, a little battery. It is so simple. It's first very deep database. So it has every kind of food you can think of from any kind of chain. We had the help of 65 students help us work on this from all the schools in the area. Um, and then we created this solution that is so simple that because it's voice powered and fun to use, you don't have to worry about a nutrition fact labeled anymore. I got an email from a young woman in Baton Rouge where I made a presentation on this just a few days ago. And she said, you know what? My little girl, here she is, Lydia. She first got very excited about the app because of the mic and you could talk and get the information. But now she's using it seriously. She says, mom, look, there is so much bad fat in your granola bar. <laughs> so my dream is that we take this to the next generation because our kids understand this and they have the power and they know how to use the technology. We take it to the level where we could even identify one day from a smelling phone that will talk to you what's in my trout, the peptides, the molecules. We could identify which one is the good one versus the bad one. What is in that trout? What has it been eating? I want to know. So what's my food been eating? Ask yourself again. And remember, we need to empower our kids to set this new standard so that we stand a chance to eradicate obesity together. We can do this. Thank you. Yeah.